Good evening, everyone. My name is Andrew Fracknoy. I'm the astronomy instructor here at Foothill College in Los Altos, California. And I'm delighted to welcome everyone here in the Smithwick Theater and everyone listening or watching us on the web to this very special lecture uh, in the 13th annual Silicon Valley Astronomy Lecture Series. Our lectures are co-sponsored by four organizations, the Foothill College Astronomy Department, NASA's Ames Research Center, the uh, SETI, or Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence Institute here in Mountain View, and the Astronomical Society of the Pacific, a public education organization, a venerable public education organization in astronomy. Um, we present a series of lectures. We've been doing this now for the 13 years of non-technical talks on new developments in astronomy. And we have a very special speaker today, uh, Dr. Sandra Faber. Uh, Dr. Faber is the interim director of the University of California Observatories and university professor at the University of California at Santa Cruz in astronomy. Dr. Faber has a very distinguished record of astronomical work and discoveries. Uh, she was one of three astronomers who diagnosed the flaw in the mirror of the Hubble Space Telescope, and she played a major role in the repair and continuing wonderful work of that instrument. Uh, she established the scientific case for the giant Keck telescopes, now operating in Hawaii, and has helped develop instruments for them to probe the earliest epochs of the cosmos. Her primary research interests include the formation and distribution of galaxies and cosmology, the study of the properties of the entire universe. She was a member of the group that we affectionately call the Seven Samurai, who established some of the important understandings that we have about the structure of the large-scale universe. And she was also one of the creators of the cold dark matter theory, which is our best theory for how the cosmos developed the present structure, the, de the structure that it has today. She has received many awards for her work, including the Bruce Medal of the Astronomical Society of the Pacific. But as many of you know, she received a wonderful recognition this past weekend when she was in Washington to receive the 2013 National Medal of Science from President Obama. And during the ceremonies, President Obama leaned over and said something to her privately. So we're hoping she'll fill us in on what that ceremony was like and what the president had to say. So here, talking about how galaxies were cooked from the primordial soup, it is both a pleasure and a privilege to present to you Dr. Sandra Faber. Thank you, Andy, for that wonderful introduction. Well, this is a first for me. This is certainly the largest crowd I've ever addressed, so it's really quite an honor to be in front of you today. Uh, you want to know what the president said? He is, by the way, an incredibly charming man in person, and he gave us a lot of his time, and everybody in that room uh, was had sort of fell in love with him by the end of the day. Uh, he said to me, very confidentially, it was. <laughs> it's really cool. And what he meant by that was astronomy is really cool. <laughs> and he is right. <laughs> That's why we're all here tonight. So I thought that was a, exactly the right thing to say. I don't think he said that to anybody else who was getting a medal. <laughs> so um, I'd like to start with a bit of an advertisement. As uh, Andy said, I am the interim director of the University of California Observatories. And one of our observatory sites, the oldest and most distinguished, is Lick Observatory, which is within shouting distance here, visible from Silicon Valley. And what I wanted to tell you about this evening is uh, the fact that we've started a new organization for Lick Observatory called Friends of Lick. And this is, um, you know, we've all been listening to KQED, right? Raise money. So I have all the right words at my fingertips. You know. 
So there's the $50 membership and there's a $150 membership. And, a, and for only a quarter a day, you could get. <laughs> but seriously, we do have a lot of le different levels that can appeal to everybody, I think. And lots of perks, including souvenirs, uh, special entree to events up at LEC. You'd be surprised the number of events that we're hosting there uh, during the course of a year, including a very, very full packed summer program with our Music of the Spheres concerts. They get sold out. If you're a friend of LIC, though, you can always guarantee a seat. And um, if you're a, a particularly aspiring person, you might want to join our James Lick Society, which entitles you to an evening with the telescope for your, you and your group. So consider LIC as the ultimate romantic venue for <laughs> weddings, bar mitzvahs. <laughs> All of those things. We'd love to host you. And you can even camp there for a small fee. So lots of stuff is happening up there, and we hope to see you. We have two volunteers here, Pam and Rob, who uh, would be happy to give you a brochure. Here are the brochures. And even if you can't afford even the smallest donation you can get in for free, the white brochure tells you how to do that. And I have to tell you that um, the AAA gives us a gem designation and calls us a must-see of exceptional interest and quality. So it's not far away. We hope to see you there. So let's uh, now move to the subject of the talk. And I promise that the rest of the talk will be commercial free. <laughs> so cooking galaxies from the primordial soup. Now, I'm really hoping to give you all the cocktail party answer for how galaxies form. For me, the cocktail party answer is really the test of whether you understand a subject or not. You know, can you craft the answer in 30 seconds, maximum two minutes, um, before you exhaust the patience of your listener? Can you get to the heart of the issue and make them understand what you're talking about in a very short period of time? That's what I'm going to try to do for you this evening. In 45 minutes, I'm going to give you a little bit more background than that. But by the end of this talk, you yourself, at your next cocktail party, should be able to go out and answer all of those people who are going to crowd around you and ask you how galaxies formed. <laughs> OK, so um, it's very opportune that we discuss this topic right now in this year because about 50 years ago, a landmark event in astronomy occurred having to do with cosmology and galaxy formation. Yes, you guessed it. Sandra Faber took her first course in astronomy. <laughs> no, that's not what you were thinking. The landmark event was the discovery of the cosmic microwave background radiation, which occurred just about 50 years ago. And that really opened the modern era of cosmology and was a discovery that allowed us to begin putting together the pieces for where galaxies came from. The hot microwave background was the proof for most astronomers that the universe began in a big bang, a hot big bang. And that proves to be absolutely crucial to our story of galaxy formation. But I'm getting ahead of myself. So uh, let's instead pause for a second and remind ourselves what galaxies really are. So I think it would be wonderful if you came out of this lecture with a sort of a cosmic map, a vision of what the cosmic landscape is like like being on Mars. What's it like to be on Mars? This film here tells us what it is like to actually be in intergalactic space and look around at galaxies. And it starts by flying around through our own galaxy. So you'll recognize a familiar sight here. This is Orion. We're starting on Earth. And this is the plane of the Milky Way. So let's start our movie going here. OK. There we go. So we're, we're flying towards Orion. And the first thing we note is that Orion is sort of disappearing. And that's because it's not a real group of stars. It's just a, 
uh, concatenation of stars along the line of sight. And the sword turns out to be not a star, but a cloud of glowing gas. It's a place where stars are forming, and there are some four very bright, hot stars emitting ultraviolet light that is causing the surrounding clouds of gas to shine. And we just flew through another similar region, the Horsehead Nebula. And we're coming up on a third here. This is the Rosette Nebula. And as we fly through the Rosette, we're going to see, again, a cluster of young stars, just a few million years old, each one a million times brighter than our sun, and lighting up the interstellar gas from which they have formed. Now we continue to fly through our galaxy, and the next cloud of gas that we see is not young. In fact, it's old. It is a supernova that exploded about 1,000 years ago, the Crowd Nebula. And if you look really closely, you can see the pulsar pulsing in the middle of the nebula. So we've sort of encapsulated stellar birth and stellar death in our, our ride. Now, this is the best part of the film, I think. This is where we fly out of the galaxy, and you begin to get some feeling for what its geometry is like, how many stars are in it. And the cool thing is that this is a real galaxy. They somehow morphed the film into NGC 5383, catchy name. And uh, here are the Magellanic Clouds surrounding our galaxy. Our galaxy is rather similar in size and shape to NGC 5383, so it's a, it's a good likeness. And now we're going to fly through M33, the Triangulum Galaxy, and it has another uh, glowing nebula, <coughs> which is a cluster of stars. Here's our big neighbor in space, the Andromeda Galaxy. And now the ca camera is panning out of the local group out into intergalactic space, and we're passing by some very familiar nearby galaxies that all amateurs would know and recognize. Here is M101, for example. Here's the Whirlpool Nebula, where Lord Ross discovered spiral structure. And as you look around now, you, the, the miracle of this film is that every one of these objects you see here is a real galaxy. And its distance was calculated by this man here, Brent Tully, in Hawaii. He made the first accurate map of the nearby cosmic landscape. And so he's located every galaxy in space, according to a distance estimate. And you can see that they're not uniformly distributed. They're in filaments, and the filaments tend to intersect. And the nearest such intersection is the Virgo cluster of galaxies, about 1,000 objects, where this giant monster galaxy, M87, sits at the middle with the largest known black hole, 10 billion solar masses right there. And it's a good thing that the movie stopped before we went any further. Okay. <laughs> So this, this film is, is really great because um, everything is in its proper place with its proper size. So you get a feeling for how big empty space is and how fully densely occupied it is. There's only one um, slight of hand here, and that is that everything got made brighter. And uh, uh, because otherwise you'd need telescopes to see these things. So they brightened up the images for the purpose of the film. And the other point is that we didn't pay any attention to the speed of light. We're flying here at six trillion times the speed of light. <laughs> so that's probably the fastest ride you'll ever get. Now, this is what we are trying to explain. We're trying to explain this collection of objects. As you will already have gathered, galaxies are really the building blocks of the universe. And they, they look different. There are big ones, there are small ones, there are round ones, there are flattened ones. We're trying to understand here tonight why they exist at all and why they assume their various forms. So we need to cook. And in order to cook, we need a recipe. And here is um, one laboratory's recipe, Fermilab's recipe for primordial soup. Okay. And what's in this recipe? Well, quarks, force carriers, whatever they are, something like electrons, neutrinos, bosons, etc. Yeah. Is this what we need to make galaxies? And the answer is no. OK, so here is a better look, a pie chart that tells us what is really in the universe. And the important part for making galaxies is this part right here. This is the matter. 
matter generates attractive galaxies, and we need the gravity of matter to pull the galaxy together. Now, the stuff that we saw in primordial soup from Fermilab was just that part. It was the normal part. It was the matter of this room. It was the matter of the periodic table. And one of the great discoveries of the last few decades is the fact that most of the matter in the universe is not like it. It's something else called dark matter. And as yet, we don't know what it is. It's probably some kind of new elementary particle, maybe a mixture of such particles. And our physicist colleagues are trying to generate it over at the Large Hedron Collider and have a very good chance of succeeding in doing that. Now, dark matter is everywhere. It's here in this room. Uh, in, in, there's about one dark matter particle in a quart container. And that particle is moving with a speed of several hundred kilometers a second in an orbit about the center of the galaxy, just the way the sun orbits the center of the galaxy. The galaxy is held together by its own gravity. And so there's this swarm of dark matter particles in our galaxy that collectively make up about four-fifths of all the, all the matter. The dark matter is here, but indetectable because it's, um, it's called weakly interacting. It's like a neutrino. So it can go through experiments. It can go through people. It can go through walls. And you don't even know it's there. It's very ghostly stuff. The only reason we know it's there is because we measure its gravity. It's actually holding our galaxy together. And if we took the dark matter away, our galaxy with all the stars would just fly apart. They would, they would um, fly away into intergalactic space. So we now know a lot more about this matter. <clears throat> and it's heavy and sluggishly moving, and that has given it the, the name cold dark matter. Now, the whole theory is called lambda CDM. CDM is cold dark matter. And this lambda here, what's that for? We won't talk too much about that tonight. That is this stuff called dark energy, which is, for my way of thinking, the weirdest thing in all of physics. And dark energy is not matter. It generates gravity, but it generates repulsive gravity. So if you've heard that the universe is accelerating, it's because it contains mostly this stuff. Look, 75%, there's a lot of this stuff causing the expansion to actually accelerate. And this is shutting down gravity, galaxy formation, which depends on attractive gravity. So we're very lucky that early in our universe, gravity, normal gravity, won out and made galaxies. The era of galaxy formation is ending, though, because we're becoming more and more dominated by this lambda stuff. Now, if we want to understand galaxy formation, fortunately, we can pretty much ignore this stuff. So I'm going to do that for the rest of this talk, and I'm only going to talk about the attractive gravity from ordinary matter. Now, that's our recipe to put in the primordial soup. We now know the ingredients. But there's a catch for galaxy formation that's a little bit like, not like cooking. So, you know, if you make scrambled eggs, you don't really care where you put the egg. If you cook carrots, it doesn't matter to you exactly how they're arranged in the pan. But if you want to make galaxies, you have to put matter in exactly the right places. And the way we know about this is by studying the cosmic microwave background radiation, which we measure on the celestial sphere. The Earth is at the center of this sphere. So imagine flying outside the universe, the visible universe, and looking at it from the outside. You can see that this cosmic microwave background radiation is not uniform. It varies very slightly from place to place on the sphere. Only a part in 100,000. It's a very small variation, but it's a very important variation. And furthermore, as you look at this picture, you can see that these dimples here, they have sort of a characteristic size. And that size turns out to be about the size of the full moon. And it's possible to study that size distribution and develop a, a, an expression for it that's very quantitative and measure it. And those are the white points. And the theory that comes out of the expanding universe predicts the blue curve 
This is this um, lambda CDM theory. And you can just see what a fabulous agreement there is between the observations and the predictions of the theory. So in other words, what we know very accurately now is how lumpy the universe is and where the lumps are located, at least in a statistical sense. And it's those lumps that are going to be the seeds for galaxy formation. What I'm trying to convince you of here is that this is a very, very well understood subject. So now let's look in more detail about what happens when there are lumps. So let's fly through the early universe before the lumps had developed to any extent. And the, why, what, what do I mean by that? I would say, you know, the first few hundred thousand years, the first few million years, that's, that's the era we're talking about. And we're flying through the universe and we have a little meter that records the density of uh, energy and matter in our vicinity. <clears throat> and we see that it's not uniform. Those are the lumps that, that we were just seeing in the cosmic microwave background. And as I said, they're very small. They're only a part in 100,000. That's all it takes to make galaxies, is lumps that are so, so in, insignificant, they're almost infinitesimal. Now, in the neighborhood of one of those lumps, there is a peak. And the peaks have a little bit of extra gravity in their vicinity. The universe is expanding. There's a little bit of extra matter there. The peak is attractive and draws matter into it. And that causes the peak to grow. When the peak grows, it attracts more matter. So the word that physicists use for this is an instability, a runaway. I put in a small peak, it grows to a bigger peak. So let's look at models of this process. I'm going to show you a couple of films now of um, galaxy formation. And in each film, we're going to start with a region of space which um, is characteristic. See, this, this little region here is looking like a sphere, but there could have been a sphere just like it over here and one there and one there, okay? We just picked out one little patch of space to be visualized here. And this number here counts down to zero from an early time in the past to now. And this number here means that the universe was about 50 times smaller at the beginning of this film than it is now. So let's watch what happens. The material in this, sorry, I have a new version of PowerPoint here, so, okay. There we go, let me pause it, okay. The material didn't start out quite uniform. It started out lumpy. And this instability I was telling you about actually took place. And so it looked quite smooth at the beginning of the film, but just a couple of doubling times, and now look how lumpy it is. And if you'll keep your eye on, uh, say, these two little fluctuations here as the film goes on, then what you'll see is that those two lumps will merge. And those lumps, in turn, will merge with other lumps in a hierarchical fashion. So that the word that astronomers use to describe this is hierarchical clustering. Let's just watch this for a while. Okay. So this movie was made in 1989. It's one of the first simulations. I like it, though, because I like the rendering. And you can see so clearly what's going on. So this is a cluster of galaxies forming here. You'd see how a cluster forms. Uh, here, here's a galaxy with, uh, falling into the cluster, and then it orbits a little bit, you know. So you can see quite clearly from this film how that works. Now, this is, as I say, a primitive film. Let's look at the next one, which is, was made by my colleagues in Santa Cruz, and is one of the most sophisticated films. Hmm, why is this happening? Here we go. OK. This is a patch of space that is now rendered in much greater detail. There are 10 billion particles in this space, all interacting by gravity. And at the beginning of the film, they were put in in lumps in just such a way as to mimic the lumpiness of the real universe. 
This particular patch is uh, what we imagine the Milky Way to look like as it was forming. So you can see how busy this process is. Okay, so the next slide shows us what we just saw in the previous film and superposes the visible Milky Way. So as I was telling you at the beginning of this lecture, most of the matter is dark matter. And that's what we've actually been looking at in this clustering process. The dark matter is easy to model. And we now understand its clustering behavior in great detail. It makes these gigantic halos, dark matter halos, within which are embedded the visible galaxies. And to give you some sense of scale, this is the visible Milky Way. And in the Milky Way, we're about there. So we're deeply embedded in this dark matter halo of our own galaxy. Now, in modeling the dark matter, we haven't yet made anything that we can see in a telescope because the dark matter is invisible. It doesn't shine. It doesn't emit any light. It's totally indetectable. The reason we see galaxies is that mixed up with them, about one part in 20%, one part in five, is ordinary matter. And the ordinary matter comes out of the Big Bang as gas, and the gas condenses into stars, and the stars shine. And that's what we see in the telescope. But gas is a lot more complicated than dark matter is. And so we've been slower to be able to model it. This is, I think, my favorite film, which models the gas. Previous film showed the dark matter, no gas. This film shows the Milky Way forming with the gas and stars, but no dark matter. Dark matter is really the scaffolding on which the galaxies are forming. It's all the gravitational impulse, the attraction, is coming from the dark matter. And you can see this tendency during the clustering to make this, these filamentary structures. And then the filaments intersect. Proto-galaxies drain in to the intersections and then collide. When a collision occurs, all previous stars are thrown into a stellar halo. And any leftover gas and new gas that's falling in collects in a new disk, a rotating disk. So <clears throat> the impression that you get from these simulations is that the early formation of the Milky Way was very chaotic. There was a lot of merging going on, a lot of disturbance going on. Old stars formed in disks, but then got thrown into halos. And then new gas fell in and reformed the disk. So a prediction of this whole picture is that galaxies ought to consist of part spheroidal halos of old stars that got um, disturbed during, by collisions together with disks. And that's it. what we see here in this picture. We're going to pan around and get a better view of this galaxy now. It's got a gaseous disk, the blue diffuse material, and a spheroidal halo of, of stars. A really great rendering. Now, the nice thing is that real galaxies actually exhibit these features. They exhibit both disks and spheroids, just like the models. So here are some objects that are mostly disks, like our galaxy. Our Milky Way is more like this. And here are some objects that are mostly spheroids. And you could see how easily it would be to wind up with one or the other of these extremes, depending on exactly what the merging history is. How disturbed, if you were rather isolated, you wouldn't merge and you'd be mostly disk. If you were in a dense region with lots of things around you, you would collide a lot, and all of your stars would be thrown up into a spheroid. So that's very encouraging to see right away that from the morphologies of galaxies, this picture is, is uh, matching them pretty well. Now, it's important to realize that galaxies are just part of a bigger picture. We call it large-scale structure. Andy mentioned it in his introduction. 
So this is a map. We are here looking out into space. This is a map of how galaxies are distributed around us in uh, the nearby universe. And you can see this point that it's not uniform. And we can, we can model that extremely well. Here is a, a numerical simulation that is making not only galaxies, but on a larger scale, it's making this structure too. All of this formed by a gravity. The galaxies form by a gravity, and this large scale structure does too. It's part of the same process. And the reason it's part of the same process is because in the early universe, there was a machine that generated these lumps and generated the lumps on all scales. And this is an amazing graph which compares measurements of lumps. How, this is a measure of how lumpy the universe is on this particular mass scale versus the prediction. And again, a beautiful example of how data and theory are, are overlapping perfectly. I'm going to say more about where the lumps came from and the theory that generates them. But what I'm trying to say here is that this is all one big process. Look, 10 to the 12th solar masses up to 10 to the 22. This is 10 orders of magnitude in mass. And this is about um, 10 to the 7th orders of magnitude in lumpiness. And galaxies are here, and the large scale structure that we just looked at is there. So let's summarize what we've learned so far. Two key components of galaxy formation. Hierarchical clustering of dark matter halos and simultaneously cooling and infall of normal matter, the gas, towards the centers of the galaxies. And this gas falls to the center. It makes rotating disks there. That's what we saw in the movie. The gas cools, falls to the center, makes spinning rotating disks in which the stars form. And because there's this inward falling in motion, these disks are small compared to the dark halos. And that's why the Milky Way looks small compared to its modeled dark matter halo. So thus far, I've been talking about the galaxies that live at the centers of halos. But you can see, because of this clustering process, it's possible for a satellite galaxy in its dark matter halo to fall into a bigger one. And that's how we generate clusters of galaxies. They're just bigger halos with galaxies embedded in them. And we distinguish. This is a central galaxy, and that's a satellite. Now, one of the great puzzles of galaxy formation is what the gas does. And that's all bound up in how the gas makes stars. And this is really an unsolved problem. But it's great to look at movies. So let's look at a movie of, by some people who think they know what's going on. OK, so here is a disk of a galaxy, like our Milky Way, full of gas. And some stars are forming, and supernovae are going off. And when the supernovae go off, they move the gas around and cause a lot of the gas to be ejected. This is actually a good thing, because when we do a census of the universe and try to figure out how much material there is in the visible galaxies versus out in intergalactic space, only a very small fraction of even the ordinary matter is actually in the galaxies. This is a problem, because if we just let it fall in the way it wants to do, galaxies should be bigger than they are observed to be. And so we have to invoke this process. It's kind of a mystery. We're sort of doing it schematically so far. It's called feedback. And it has to be very powerful and eject most of the gaseous matter out of the galaxy where it never even makes stars at all. So as I say, Understanding this is still pretty rudimentary. Here's another simulation by my colleagues at Santa Cruz. I just show it to you so that you really see how this feedback process, what it actually looks like during the hierarchical assembly of the galaxies. So you keep seeing material that is being ejected, and it's being sped out into intergalactic space by these supernova explosions.
Now let's continue to compare the predictions of this model with what we actually see in real galaxies. For those of you who know something about astronomy, you probably recognize this Edwin Hubble's classification scheme, so-called Hubble types. And this is a famous diagram with elliptical sort of spheroidal objects here and disky galaxies over here. Hubble divided them into barred spirals versus normal spirals. That turns out not to be very important, so let's just sort of block out the barred spirals and consider this to be one sequence. Now, one of the things we've learned in the last 20 or 30 years is that a lot of things vary systematically along this sequence. For one thing, the Hubble sequence turns out to be a sequence in galaxy mass. At the top end are these spheroidal elliptical galaxies. They're the most massive. Then we have SAs, SCs, SDs and SMs, and irregular galaxies at the bottom. And I've shown them all to look sort of the same, but actually, no, this is a thousand times less massive than that one. If I showed you a real picture, true to size, you wouldn't really see any of the details. OK, so this is the basic sequence is a sequence in mass. It's also a sequence in star formation rate. And that is very easy to apprehend, because when stars are forming, star forming regions are blue. That's because young stars are very bright and blue in the ultraviolet, very hot. Whereas non-star forming regions are red and dead, like these regions here. So all you have to do is look at a color picture of a galaxy, and you can tell if it's forming stars, and if so, where it is forming stars. And finally, the last trend here is a trend with environment. The ellipticals are form, found in clusters, whereas these normal spirals, like the Milky Way, are kind of intermediate. They're neither isolated nor in clusters. We're in a local group. And then these irregulars are, in general, very isolated. So what I'd like to talk about next is the simple theory that explains all this. We've got all the tools assembled. Let's put them together and draw some very simple and pretty obvious conclusions. Now, it, it turns out that the, the most important cartoon to keep in your brain is this one, which tells you how dark matter clusters as a function of time. So let's get acquainted with these coordinates. This is the mass of dark halos. And this one here is a time coordinate. The Big Bang is over here. And we're coming to the present here. So the next graph shows some calculations by a friend of mine, Andrea Catania, which picked from his dark matter simulation four halos as a function of time. And he measured their mass growth. And you've seen this happening, so it, sh it should look obvious, right? The halos start out small at early times, and stuff falls into them. And that's how they grow. So that's what he's plotted here, the four typical halos. Now, it, it, it turns out that these halo masses are identified with visible structures. When you have halos at this level, by the way, remember, this is now here, OK? Zero is now. When you have halos right here, that corresponds to clusters of galaxies, maybe 100 or 1,000 galaxies in a cluster like that. These intermediate-sized halos correspond to groups. And these halos down here correspond to individual galaxies. And the Milky Way and Andromeda, M31, their halos are right in here, dividing them between galaxies and groups. Our group is, local group is pretty puny. So we're right on the dividing line here. So now let's look. Here are our four halos. Let's plot from Andrea some smaller halos. And the point I'm showing you here is that there's a pattern. There's some randomness. The lines are wiggly. They're not perfectly predictable. That makes a lot of sense, because 
these lumps are falling in, and who knows exactly when a lump falls in. But there is a certain pattern here, a certain overall rule. And so we could replace the individual wiggly lines with something that looks simpler, like that. And we observe that there's a bottom here, but that's an artifact. It came from the fact that Andrea's simulations really couldn't model very small things. He, couldn't, he didn't have enough particles in his simulation to look at small things. So let's just fix that. Okay, we know they're there. He just didn't have them. Okay, so now I'm coming to one of the key assumptions or discoveries in this talk. The key assumption is that there is a band in this graph where you're allowed to make stars, the star forming band. If you're not in this band, your halo is not allowed to make stars. And furthermore, there seems to be an upper limit, call it m crit, which is quite well determined, and there's some physics for that. I'm going to tell you what the physics are here. There seems to be a less well understood bottom limit, and I won't talk about that m threshold because it, that's not very well understood. But they both do seem to exist. Now the next step was truly a step of genius and a few young professors made it about a decade ago. They said, what if I just assume that every location in this plot has its own star formation rate? In other words, the star formation rate depends only on the halo mass and the time. That's these two coordinates. This is the halo mass and this is the time. So they put in some simple rules with some unknown parameters and tried to use the data to determine what the parameters were and then predicted other data. And it was amazing the agreement with the galaxy properties that came out. In other words, this assumption that every one of those little points here has a well-determined star formation rate seems to work. Now, that has some interesting implications. Let's just work them out, pretty simple. Let's ask ourselves, where do the Hubble types of today belong in this picture? Can we interpret them? Let me remind you that this is today. Zero is today. So we're asking ourselves, where are Hubble types in this vertical band today? And let's start with a galaxy type that we know and love, namely the ellipticals. So let me remind you, ellipticals are very massive, and they're not making stars. Where do we put them in this diagram in order to match that? Well, it seems reasonable that if a galaxy is massive, its halo is massive, so we want to put it up here somewhere. And that's good, because this entire region of the diagram is not making stars, and we've just seen that ellipticals don't make stars. Their populations are red and dead. So how did this elliptical get where it is in its halo? Its halo crossed over M crit billions of years ago. And so it's been dead for this entire period of time. It hasn't been making stars. No wonder it's, it looks red and its population looks old. Great. Let's now pick another Hubble type. How about this late type irregular? Remember, it was very small. And it was making stars like MAD. And so small galaxies belong down there. And this one looks active because it's just turning on. It's just entering the star forming band. It has very few old stars because it's been dead up to now. And suddenly, pow, the star formation is turning on and it's full of blue stars. It's entering its heyday. Intermediate objects are obviously going to be somewhere in the middle. Okay, and so here's the whole Hubble sequence today. The explanation of the Hubble sequence in this picture is that where you are along the sequence depends on your halo mass today. And why do you have different halo masses? How did this halo get to be massive and this one down here not? 
it's because it started out with a big peak. It was a lucky guy in the early universe. You saw that the peaks were random. Some peaks were big, some peaks were small. This galaxy formed around a very early big peak, and this one, a puny peak. It's really sort of retarded. It's only getting started now. We have a really great sanity check for all of this because in the local group, we can actually measure these halo masses. And our neighbor, Andromeda, has a halo mass of about 10 to the 12th solar masses right there. So that's where we would want to put it in the diagram. And great, great agreement. Here it is. It's a sort of an early Hubble type. It's got a, a sort of a, an old spheroid in the middle and a disk. It's exactly where it belongs to be. So now we can sort of put all this together to coin a, a term that maybe you'll be able to carry away at the end of the lecture. Let's describe the star formation in these various types of galaxies. This is supposed to be the star formation rate. And in my little animation here, star formation is a wave that started out in the big galaxies when they were back here, and today is now just reaching the small galaxies. And all this does is indicate when halos of different masses are passing through the star farming band. This is called downsizing. The term was co coined back in 1996. People didn't know where it came from, but now we have explained that. OK, so now the question is, um, What's the origin of the upper part of this band? Obviously, it's this that shuts down the star formation in these Hubble types here. So where does that come from? Well, actually, that physics has been known for a long time. Uh, it comes from the fact that gas, as it's falling into these halos, changes its character over time. So here is our little hierarchical clustering cartoon. And if we look at the temperature of gas, in this halo versus that one, it's hotter here. That's because objects move more rapidly in this halo, including the atoms. That means that they're hotter. They have higher temperature. But at the same time, these halos are more diffuse. And when you look at basic atomic physics and ask to what extent a gas can cool, it needs to cool in order to fall onto the galaxies and make stars. This combination of being both hot and diffuse is deadly. So in these massive halos, the gas is falling in, and it's staying hot. And we can see it in X-ray telescopes. It's not falling onto the galaxies. So let me show you another nice video of this. This now, this is an, another clustering video, except I haven't started it. There we go, OK? The temperature here, or the color here, um, tells you the gas temperature. So you, you can pick a lump, and you can follow the temperature of the gas. And you can see that as the lumps are getting bigger, as the dark halos are growing, the gas that is populating them is getting hotter and hotter. And I really love the end of this video, where the, this is making a cluster. So let's, let's look at the end of this here, except that wasn't a good idea. Try it again. There we are, OK? At this point, we've made a cluster. And small galaxies are forming into This is a gigantic mass of gas. It wanted to make galaxies, but it couldn't cool and fall onto them. And so it's just sitting there as a hot blob. OK, so in the interest of um, truthfulness, uh, I have to reveal that there is a problem. Okay. Let's look in this, in this closet. There's something that we have not explained. It's called the missing satellite problem. Now, you might think that the missing satellite problem is a NASA problem, the fact that NASA is not sending up enough space missions and our space shuttles are being retired. This is not what we mean by the missing satellites problem. 
Instead, what is going on here is that the theory is predicting tons of satellite galaxies around the Milky Way and other spirals like us, and we don't see them. Okay. You will already have noticed this in the picture that I showed you. Remember, this is the dark matter simulation. And look at all of these satellites that are predicted, 10,000 satellites. And in fact, in the Milky Way, we see very few satellites, just on the order of tens, not 10,000s. Here's a map of the satellites around the Milky Way. There are way too few satellites, the missing satellites. And here, this picture quantifies that by saying that of the 10 biggest subhalos, which we think should exist in the halo of the Milky Way, we only see two. We see the large Magellanic Cloud and the small Magellanic Cloud. But the other eight are invisible, and somehow um, we think they're out there, but they're not making stars. And this is the major unsolved problem of galaxy formation. Maybe their winds, their feedback is so strong that they've just blown themselves apart. It's not clear. So until we understand how star formation really works and where the gas goes and how it flows out of galaxies, we will not have solved this issue. It's been with us now for almost 10 years, so it's a pretty serious problem. Despite this, uh, theorists are convinced that this is the correct theory, that the Lambda CDM model for structure formation in the universe is, exact, is in fact the right picture. So if we're to believe this theory, we have to come to grips with one of the key ingredients, which I've glossed over up to now, and that is the origin of the density fluctuations. And I think, actually, this is the most interesting part of the theory. That's these fluctuations that are known empirically to be about a part in 100,000. If they aren't that right amplitude, we don't get galaxies with the right properties. And as we've seen, these fluctuations create peaks and valleys, and it's the peaks that act as the seeds, gravitational seeds, for galaxy formation. So the interesting thing now is, where did those fluctuations come from? And the answer is totally fascinating. They're quantum fluctuations. Here in this room, empty space, or nearly empty space, is actually not empty. It's full of particles that are continually appearing and disappearing. This is possible because of quantum fluctuations. The actual energy density of a little region of space is uncertain, especially on short time scales. And so the actual mechanism that reflects that is the appearance and disappearance of these matter and antimatter particles. Now, here in this room, we don't notice this because the particles, they are created and they soon recombine. And all of this is going on on very small scales and doesn't bother us. But early in the history of the universe, the universe expansion was very unusual. The expansion was faster than light, actually. That was driven by very unusual physics at that time, actually by a kind of dark energy caused the universe to accelerate. Believe it or not, a universe can expand faster than the speed of light. It is possible. And when that happens, those little matter-antimatter pairs that are created are ripped apart before they can recombine. And they're left there as little fluctuations. And so that's where we believe these small fluctuations are coming from an early stage in the history of the universe at 10 to the minus 35 seconds called inflation when the universe was expanding faster than the speed of light. So that is quite a takeaway message to think that here we are in our Milky Way, 100,000 light years up in size. It's that whole galaxy that we live inside of started out as a small quantum fluctuation about 10 to the minus 33 centimeters in diameter at a time 10 to the minus 35 seconds after the Big Bang. I think that is cool. <laughs> so let's um, summarize our takeaway points from Lambda CDM. This is, uh, I hope you're taking notes. This is, this is your cocktail party answer here coming up. 
Galaxies and large-scale structure are part of the same process and both form by a gravitational attraction around density peaks. The density peaks were created at 10 to the minus 35 seconds after the Big Bang when the universe expanded faster than the speed of light, they are quantum fluctuations. Galaxies are mostly dark matter, which is the scaffolding on which the visible galaxy is hung. And the stars and gas, the familiar stars and gas, are only about 15% of the total. The Hubble sequence is a sequence in star formation rate and clustering environment versus mass. The sequence can be explained if larger galaxies are formed in larger dark matter halos. And finally, a key part of this explanation is that galaxies stopped forming stars when their dark halos passed over a critical mass that's something like 10 to the 12th solar masses. That's when galaxies go out. And that's where Andromeda is now, and that's also where our Milky Way is now, and both of those galaxies are in the process of going out. And so I'll just leave you once more with this idea of quantum fluctuations seeding all the large-scale structure in the universe. And um, I'll remind you of something that I'm sure many of you have heard of, and that is Schrodinger's cat. This problem of quantum fluctuations generating galaxies brings us right up against the quandary and conundrums of, of quantum mechanics. I thought I could ignore quantum mechanics, you know, it's all, I'm studying big stuff, I don't have to worry about this little stuff. And now it turns out that the Milky Way is Schrodinger's cat. It is a quantum fluctuation that got captured and frozen in, in its case by the expanding universe, and here we are today. So we can't really understand our macroscopic reality in our galaxy without truly understanding quantum mechanics. And I suggest you have the next lecturer teach you about that subject. <laughs> Thank you. We really appreciate your making us your very next stop after the White House. That's wonderful, and thank you for the illuminating lecture. Uh, we are now uh, in the question and answer phase of the program, and Dr. Faber has very kindly agreed to take questions. There are two microphones in the center of the auditorium. If you would line up at the microphones, I'll ask you to take them one by one, one side and the other one, democratically. And, uh, Please keep your questions short and to the point, and we'll get started as soon as people can line up. Uh, if you do need to leave, we understand, but please do so quietly, and we'll get started with the questions in a minute. You take a deep breath and drink a little water, and people are starting to line up. Okay, so are the microphones on? Are we ready in the booth? Uh, microphones on the auditorium? Great, so why don't we, you pick a side and we'll get started. Okay, let's start with the red states over there. Okay, very good. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, I, want, I have a question about the radii if, of the halos. Are those uh, well enough known, presumably from lensing, that one could sort of tabulate radii against the mass, the, the baryonic mass of the galaxies. Is that data available? And has anyone ever made that comparison? Yeah, people do that all the time, actually. Um, I like your mention of um, galaxy gravitational lensing, which is a great way of trying to figure out what invisible matter is doing in the exterior parts of galaxies. So what people do is um, they pick galaxies of a certain class, like a certain stellar mass, and you might have 100 of them, and they would all be lensed in slightly different ways that would give you, uh, you could do a statistical sum which would tell you what the average halo around that galaxy looked like. And that's what people do. Yeah. And it, it works. <laughs> Blue states. Yeah, in your, in, 
is, is this on? Yeah. Okay. You, you know, the galaxies are rotating. Is there sort of some conservation of rotation? In other words, all the galaxies added up will end up as kind of like zero rotation. Is anybody ever looked into that? And, and why are they rotating? And are some going faster than the others? What's, what's the deal on that? Okay, so um, what you have to think about is that in uh, the expanding universe, carve out a big region so large that the rotation over that region is negligible. So if you could measure the angular momentum of every particle in that whole region about the center of the region, you'd find that it would average to zero. But what's happened, of course, is that they've sped each other up. And so this, this particle is moving this way, and that one is moving that way. The sum is still zero, but the individual particles are doing different things. Yes, sir. Uh, since many um, processes in nature are cyclical, how is it that you can assume that the Hubble theory um, of data collected from such a limited amount of time and from such limited locations that it will uh, forever increase, that it could not uh, slow down and reverse? Right, so that actually turns out to be a deep question. Um, we now know that our universe is accelerating. And I thought that uh, it's possible, theoretically, for that acceleration to stop. Let me just pause there and say, we had this inflationary period back at 10 to the minus 35 seconds. That was a dark energy dominated period then. The universe was accelerating, but it didn't continue. That's because the temperature fell and the physics of the material changed dumped us out into normal expansion again. Big question of today is what's going to happen to this acceleration? Will the same thing happen? And I was under the impression that if it did happen, we might get into a gravitational matter-dominated attractive phase again in which we could actually collapse. But act my, my, I'm not sure I really understand this. My physics friends at Santa Cruz say, no, that that's not true that this accelerating phase really is unstoppable and uh, we're going to expand forever, at least in this part of the universe. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm trying to understand. If I understand correctly, the large halos uh, have matter which is too diffuse and too hot to form stars. But over a long period of time, uh, some at least of that uh, temperature will be uh, radiated away. So is it possible that they will start to form stars later? Absolutely. Um, why they stay as hot as they do is not clear, because they are radiating X-ray photons. They are losing energy. They are cooling. The only question is how fast. And especially at the middles of these, where the density is higher, that's where they radiate fastest. And we really don't understand why the centers are not collapsing to make giant galaxies there. Uh, we suspect that it has something to do with the fact that at the centers of these big clusters, where, which is where these big halos are, big clusters of galaxies, there's a giant central galaxy which has built a big black hole. And that black hole is accreting matter and uh, able to send energy into the surrounding gas to keep it hot. And we actually see pretty good evidence that this is happening. It's, giant radio galaxies that send jets of material out into the intergalactic medium. Um, but uh, what the long-term future of this is going to be is, I think, a little dubious. And over time, you know, it's unstoppable. The stuff wants to fall in. It wants to cool. It wants to go down to the bottom. And if we come back in 100 billion years, we might find giant galaxies there. Yeah. That's me there. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so I have sort of a two-part question, if that's okay. Okay. Um, okay, so as you stated, uh, the universe is actually larger than what is um, observable. And I'm wondering uh, what percentage of the mass, if we know it, uh, is located outside of the ob observable universe? Okay, so nobody knows the answer to that. And it depends, the, the question was, how much more of the universe is out there that we don't see? Um, and that really depends on the history of inflation, that early inflation. If the universe inflated for a long time, then its total extent is bigger. So um, 
I think people are, are convinced that there's probably uh, something like 60 orders of magnitude more than we can see. Okay, So it's a lot. It's not factors of two or something like that. But exactly what it is, we really just don't know. Uh, that's mass? Uh, or radius. Radius, OK. Uh, that answers my second question. Mm -hmm. So my question is now based on his, because okay. it's a better question than what I had when I came up. No fair. <laughs> when you said uh, at least 60 orders of magnitude, do we have any indication that it's finite and not infinite? And do we have any way of even thinking about how to find that out? Uh, I think you really ought to have other people hold forth on this. Um, so I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I myself am attracted to a theory in which there's lots of universes. And e each one is embedded in a bigger space which is inflating. And that's the reason why we don't see the other universes because we're separated from them by space that's expanding faster than the speed of light. So if you have this picture, what is the boundary like between your energy, your, your universe and the substrate? Uh, the reason I'm hedging here is that this whole structure is, you know, like 11 dimensions. It's not just a three-dimensional structure. So um, I can't do topology that well, 11 dimensions. <laughs> yeah. Just to understand, when you're saying universe is embedded in a substrate and, and, and other universes, the, when you use the word universe there, do you mean our observable part of the universe, or do you mean the, the bigger thing that we don't see, but the, the contiguous bigger, the with bigger it? bigger thing. OK. Yeah. And the whole thing, astronomers are coming to call the metaverse. And I think the real question of cosmology now is, how different can the sub-universes be in the meta-universe? You know, is, is, is our universe typical? Do they all have? something called light? Do they all have something called gravity? They could be totally different. Yeah. The Milky Way is a, apparently a barred spiral, and the Andromeda galaxy is not a bar, is a spiral but not barred. What, any idea what makes some spirals barred and others not barred? So, um, the glib answer is, yeah, we understand that. In, in detail, we don't quite understand it. Broadly speaking, the bar versus the non-bar has to do with whether the stars are organized inside the galaxy and are on orbits that mutually reinforce each other's motion, a, a gravitational instability. Another way of thinking about it, I don't know if you know about spiral structure, but spiral arms are like that too. So bars and spiral arms are kind of relatives of one another. It turns out that if you put a disk of gas all moving in circular orbits, it doesn't want to stay that way. The gas packets and the stars want to perturb each other in order to create these circular spiral patterns, and a bar is another example of that. So in a general way, it's all explained. What we don't really understand is why some galaxies are barred and others not, when their properties, their global properties, look very similar. And the next thing we don't understand is whether a, a galaxy can go from being barred to non-barred and back again. Uh, that's an attractive theory in some ways, but um, we've not been able to ascertain if that's true yet. We do, I, I will say one thing. It's very clear that as, gal as these spiral galaxies age and their gas can content goes down and their stellar populations look older and older, they are much more likely to be barred. So it, bar is a disease that you get when you're old. <laughs> Yes, sir. Oh. I wondered whether if there's space-time outside our universe, then was there space-time before our universe or before the Big Bang in ours? Yeah, so again, you, you're asking me these really good questions that um, would be understandable. I'm trying to avoid. No, I think you just need to be a little further back. Back. 
<laughs> the podium is good. The podium, the podium was good? Okay, I'll stand here then. Um, yeah, what you really need is some um, experts in string theory because it's the dynamics of string theory that are needed in order to answer these tough questions about the metaverse and the topology of the big structure. As I understand it, string theory is only formulatable with time. Nobody has managed to make a theory that doesn't have time. There can be different spatial dimensions. Um, and so time in this picture, if this is correct, would pre-exist our universe. So the beginning of our universe, its Big Bang, would have been an event in the time of the meta-universe. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, am I up? I had a question about this uh, hyperinflation at uh, 10 to the minus 35 seconds. How does anybody know what stopped it if we don't understand the physics of the dark energy that caused it? Ah, that dark energy we do understand. It's today's dark energy that's the total mystery. Well, this, this was actually, this was brilliant. In, in 1980, when a bunch of physicists started thinking about grand unification. And um, this, it sort of helps to think about running the movie of the universe backwards. If you run it backwards, the universe is getting hotter and denser. And so then you can ask yourself, well, what do I know about physics as matter is denser and hotter? And uh, people and then were thinking in terms of a physical theory in which forces would become progressively unified at hotter and hotter temperatures. So today we have uh, electromagnetism as one force. And if we go back in time to um, a temperature of 10 to the ninth degrees or so, that will mate with the, the weak force. And so now we have the electro weak force and so on. So the next unification occurs at a temperature of 10 to the 28th degrees Kelvin. And it's supposedly associated with the presence of a scalar field, which is an energy density. And this energy density was actually predicted not to go down as the universe expands. Totally counterintuitive. And um, if you work that out in Einstein's equations, if you put an entity like that into expanding space, it makes it accelerate. So that scalar field actually comes out of pictures of grand unification. It goes away as the temperature falls. And that's why we got dumped out into normal expansion. What we don't understand is where the current dark energy comes from. The characteristic temperature now is three degrees. We thought we knew physics upside down and sideways at three degrees. And yet we have this dark energy today. Nobody knows why. So it turned off at what temperature? 10 to the 28th? Yeah. Uh, OK. Mm -hmm. Thank you. A good number to remember. <laughs> yes. I, I know that, or I'm hearing that there's massive or supermassive black holes in the middle of ga ga a lot of galaxies. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if the characteristics of the mass and age of these halos have to do with whether or not, or the characteristics of black holes in the center of the galaxies in those halos. Yes, excellent question. So something we didn't talk about tonight uh, is um, the fact that about a, a tenth of a, is it a tenth of a percent? It's, it's one one thousandth of the mass of a galaxy is, a typical galaxy is located at the center of that galaxy in a giant black hole. And the biggest ones are about 10 billion solar masses in the big galaxies. So as those holes form and as the matter falls in, it has to lose energy in order to fall in. And so, paradoxically, these forming, accreting black holes are the most luminous things in the universe. They actually radiate. The matter gets very hot right in their vicinity and shines just before it falls into the Schwarzschild radius and disappears. So all of that matter, that energy coming out of the, the forming hole, your question really is, well, could there be some feedback? What does that energy do? These are quasars. I should use a familiar, this is what a quasar is. You know, does a shining quasar with a, 
a luminosity that's a thousand times as big as a galaxy, what does it do to all the gas in its vicinity? And could there be some sort of um, negative feedback process? Could the formation of a quasar actually kill galaxy formation? So these, answer, these questions are being actively explored. Um, there are a lot of theories, and I think it's fair to say that it looks as though uh, this effect is not huge. There, although there would be some people who would disagree with me on that. So uh, I, I'm not saying that there's zero influence of the black holes on galaxy evolution, but I don't think it's overwhelming. Come back in 10 years. So three more questions, just the people who are standing. Sort of a uh, similar question. Uh, in one sense, the black holes are cleaning up the universe by sucking everything in, but Stephen Hawking says they're also evaporating. So what, what's the end game? What happens in the end? Uh, okay, black holes do evaporate. You'll remember that they um, evaporate rapidly when they're small. So the black holes at, say, the center of that big radio galaxy in Virgo, how long will that take to uh, evaporate? I actually don't know the, the answer, but I bet it's something like 10 to the 200 years or some, it's, it's some enormous amount of time. And just more energy as all these black holes evaporate? Yeah, that's right. Some stuff comes out of them, but it doesn't do much. Uh, two more questions, I'm told. Yes, sir. I, I believe you said that work at the Large Hadron Collider could possibly lead to an understanding of the weakly interactive particles. Are they the only explanation for dark matter, or are there other hypotheses on dark matter? They're certainly the best explanation at the present time. Um, physics, in a theory called supersymmetry, has sort of given us, for free, a whole new spectrum of particles. Supersymmetry, which is a very deep theory based on uh, spin, a particle spin, um, generates a whole sequence of neighbor particles, partner particles, to all the ones that we know about. And the lightest in that ladder of particles would be stable, because it can't decay, because there's nothing lighter than it. And that would be, that's our best candidate for the dark matter particle. Uh, early in this game, people tried to make the dark matter out of ordinary matter, like, you know, dim stars or black holes that formed out of gas or something. But we've now understood the recipe of the primordial soup well enough to know that the dark matter cannot be normal matter. And so if that's your only possibility, then this new kind of particle is certainly the best bet. One more. Yes, sir. It's a question about the, uh, the satellite galaxy problem. Um, is it possible that there are um, uh, dark uh, matter halos around our own galaxy that simply have no luminous matter in them. And if that's true, do you know if anyone is look, you know, trying to figure out a way to, uh, to look for those? I'm not quite sure I heard you. Is it possible that we have a dark matter halo around our own galaxy? Yeah, no, no. no. Uh, that there are um, uh, satellite dark matter halos around our galaxy that ah. simply have no luminous material in them. Right, so the missing really... satellite problem. Exactly. Yes, that's right. So. People have uh, tried to find ways of looking for them. For example, maybe they were once galaxies, but they've been ripped apart by tidal forces in the galactic magnetic field. So maybe you could find those shredded up galaxies by looking at orbits of stars and piecing things together and seeing a big tidal feature. A few of those have been found. Um, that's probably the best way of trying to find out whether there are any remnant satellites. And so far, there isn't any big smoking gun to show us that they actually exist, although we are convinced that they do. <laughs> I think I better stop there. Yeah. <laughs>